Hi guys, it's great to have you back. And uh, so today's program is the virtual sessions wine masterclass part four, everything sparkling, champagne and other bubbles. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, I'm going to be uh, muting everyone and um, you can use the space bar on your keyboard if you're watching us from a desktop computer as a push to talk feature, or you can use the chat feature in your Zoom toolbar to submit questions and I'll ask uh, Olivia on your behalf. Feel free to ask questions throughout the program. You can also feel free to keep your video on or off, whatever you're most comfortable with. This session is going to be recorded and will be added to our virtual Clubhouse resources on our website, on our mobile app, and on our YouTube page. Uh, we made sure that tonight's selections of wines were all available to our members on wines.com and I hope that you guys were able to acquire them or take a look at them in the future after we talk about them today and see which ones you think you might like best. Tonight we have Olivia Moravec on the line again um, to talk about uh, these uh, everything bubbles. I'm super appreciative that you're here Olivia so thank you so much. Um, Olivia became a certified sommelier level two through the Court of Master Sommeliers, adding wine director to her title that same year when she was only 24. She was also named in FSR Magazine's 40 Under 40 Restaurant Stars on the Rise. After working in other major U.S. cities, Olivia moved to New York City and became the dining room manager of the three Michelin star restaurant, 11 Madison Park, which I'm sure we all know. Um, at the time, it was rated number one in the world by Pellegrino's 100 Best Restaurants. Olivia's love of wine led her to work with the team at Skernick Wines, and that's how Olivia and I have connected. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Olivia Moravec. Thank you for the introduction. It's so great to be back, and especially with some familiar faces by, uh, by now, our third class together. Um, <laughs> I am going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Was everybody able to get some, some sparkling wine to enjoy this evening? Uh, some wine in general. I hope, I hope some, everybody has some, some, uh, some wine in front of them. Yes, I do, so. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so tonight we're gonna be talking about, um, about sparkling wine, how it came to be, how it's made, um, and then we'll go a little bit more in depth with, with champagne and kind of how to navigate uh, the, the wild world that, that Champagne itself in France has become. Um, so when we're talking about the history of, um, of Champagne or of, of bubbles in general, um, bubbles are made by going through um, basically a, a second fermentation that uh, creates carbon dioxide. Um, so there's a number of different ways that you can accomplish this. Um, but the first ways of doing it were either kind of an accident where uh, the yeast would, would start eating the sugars and then there would be a dormant stage and then they would start eating the sugars again. Uh, stories have it, the history of it completely is, is kind of hearsay and there's stories that have been passed down. So there's no real documentation, but I'm going to tell you the stories that do get passed down. Um, so, so stories have it that um, Champagne was originally still, still winemaking area north of Burgundy. They realized that they weren't making wine as well as Burgundy. Um, and of course, there's always going to be uh, a little bit of um, competition to be the, the better region. Um, so they continued to make red and white wine um, from the same grapes as Burgundy, Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir mostly. Uh, but they realized that they weren't, it wasn't really happening for them. Uh, in the 1500s, 1600s, story has it that uh, in the winter time, the yeast, it would get too cold for the yeast to continue fermentation. So they would pause. And then once spring happened again and the uh, cellars warmed up a little bit, the yeast would start eating the, uh, the sugars again. So creating a second fermentation, which would create these, um, these bubbles in the wine. Uh, Basically, this caused a chain reaction. So um, bubbles happen. The glass on the on the wines at the time was not strong enough to contain the bubbles. Uh, if you have a bottle of sparkling wine in front of you, um, then you can kind of feel the weight um, of the bottles is a little bit heavier than a typical bottle because it has to um, contain the bubbles. So winemakers were finding that their bottles of wine in their cellar were exploding 
uh, because this pressure was happening and they didn't know why. Um, so, so fast forward a little bit and um, people start trying to intentionally create uh, this chain reaction um, or this second fermentation. So um, started getting systematically produced sometime in the 1500s and 1600s is really the first documentation of a, of a systematic creation of the wines. Um, but uh, a lot of the, the met methodology behind it uh, wasn't solidified until um, Veuve Clicquot, uh, the widow, was making wine at, at, um, uh, at her place in, in Champagne. And she needed a new method uh, in order to create, mass produce uh, this style of Champagne. So you can see um, beside here, there's a picture, uh, which is called, the small one is, um, it, it basically it's called a Giro Palette. Uh, in, in French, um, and it's where they turn the bottles, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but that's really when the, the traditional method or the champagne method was created. Um, so two big names that are often thrown around as, as the father or mother, if you will, of champagne are Dom Perignon, who was a monk uh, who, who did make wine at, uh, at Dom Perignon um, yeah, under a different name at the time and um, Madame Clicquot. Um, at the same time, there was also a little bit of, of creation of sparkling wine actually in the Languedoc. So there is, uh, in the Languedoc, they call it Limoux, is the village that they make sparkling wine. Uh, and there is a little bit of a back and forth as far as who was making this sparkling wine first. Um, after, uh, after the 1800s, some winemakers would go to Champagne, learn how to make Champagne in the method, and that's how we got Cava and uh, other sparkling wines around the world, is from the winemakers going to the region, learning the technique, and bringing it back. Uh, so when Dom Perignon did, uh, did find the, the way to make sparkling wine, um, or discovered sparkling wine, it was written that he said, come quickly, I'm tasting the stars. Um, okay. It's, yeah, so good. I love it. Favorites in the wine world. <laughs> um, okay, so how do we actually do the method champagne, or how do we make this, um, this wine uh, in the style that they do in champagne? Um, first goes into pressing. Um, so take it, everything gets picked. We take it back into the winery. They get pressed to extract all of the juice. Um, and... <laughs> Then um, we go into the first for fermentation to actually turn the juice into the wine. Um, so this is, these first two steps are already um, pretty much the same way that you would make just any wine, white, red, uh, some rosés. Um, and so after this first fermentation is where you start getting into how to make champagne. There's a blending um, after you have all of the base wines. Uh, the, the winemaker will um, choose to leave, leave the wine as is for a time being, um, or will say, this is going to be my base wine for the year, and then they'll add some other vintages in. But if you go to Champagne, you'll walk through, and they have barrels and barrels and barrels of different vintages that typically get blended together to create a house style um, that they want their wine to consistently taste like every single year. So that when you do buy a bottle of Veuve Clicquot or Dom Perignon, uh, typically speaking, it has a house style and it'll taste pretty much the same year after year. Uh, so these master blenders um, have spent years and years studying how to make uh, or blend the wine in that house style um, in order to create something similar year after year, even if there is vintage variation. Uh, so that's how it's possible for us to go and pick up a bottle of non-vintage, it'll be marked NV, um, non-vintage sparkling wine and have it taste consistently similar. Olivia, is that similar with other, um, with other wines, reds and whites, where we see com uh, no. producers have major productions, right? Like Some people are inspired by, um, by the blending process in Champagne, um, but typically speaking, uh, are you talking about sparkling wine or any wine in general? No, just any wine, like reds and whites. Do they do that same type of thing and have that house blend? Like, you know, for those big producers, like, um, 
you know, Kendall Jackson or something, you know. Where yeah, so the, so the answer there is no. Um, typically speaking, instead of blending vintages together, uh, everybody has their, their vintage, right? They go, they harvest all of the grapes, they take it in single plots, um, and depending on the winery, they'll either bottle it in a single vineyard, so it'll say, um, you know, shave, shave Vineyard Pinot Noir, and then you know it's a single vineyard. Um, or uh, it'll just say California Pinot Noir, and that might just mean that they blended all their vineyards together. Um, but here you see vintage variation. For house styles of champagne, the goal is to not have vintage variation so that when there is a poor vintage or a poor year, the blending of the champagne isn't affected and you can still sell the champagne for the same amount of money or uh, you know, to, to maintain um, this stature of making good wine, vintage after vintage, even though it's a not vintage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, so after this blending has happened, now we have to make the bubbles or we have to create a reason for the yeast to start becoming active for a second time to create the bubbles that are going to stay in the wine for the rest of the time. And this is going to be the second fermentation. So at this point, you need to add sugar uh, as well as um, some yeast to reactivate. So once, these, uh, once the yeast starts eating the sugar again, that's where we start getting these bubbles because as a result of yeast eating sugar, we get alcohol and CO2. So after the first time, there's just a little bit, the gas fades away before it's bottled. Second time, it's really a little bit more um, substantial and is able to stay in the wine for a very long time. Um, after that second fermentation, all of the yeast dies once it's finished feasting on the sugar. Um, and kind of falls to the bottom of the bottle. And this is where we get Lee's aging. So we talked about it a little bit, if you guys were in, uh, in the white wine uh, class, there is a winemaking choice that you get to make when you're, when you're aging your wine, if you'd like to age it on the Lee's or not. In champagne, this creates a creamy or toasty characteristic. Um, and there's actually laws in different parts of the world. Champagne, you have to do at least 15 months uh, on the lees before uh, releasing the bottle. Um, for vintage champagne, it's three years. And different places in the world, they choose different amounts of time to age them on the lees. This is one of the classic, uh, classic parts of the winemaking style of champagne that really makes champagne champagne. Um, and one of the reasons that it is a little bit more expensive. So you're seeing here, even if you, you know, you've spent a year making this wine, you, you have to spend at least 15 months aging it on the lees before it can be released. So it could take you, you know, pressing and fermentation into second fer fermentation, that could take you maybe like three, four weeks, and then you have to add 15 months on top of that. So this is for their base level wine alone, they're still having to age it 15 months. So in Champagne, there are a couple things that play a part in um, how farmers are able to operate year after year, even with this aging regimen. Um, they're, for their non-vintage wines, they are by law required to hold back 10% of their wine to blend into future vintages. So if they have a bad year, then they're still able to make wine that year. Um, but like I said, a really long uh, winemaking timeline, um, which, which boosts up that, um, that price tag because of how much care goes into each individual bottle. Uh, from here, we have the spent yeasts that are still in the wine. Um, and on this last one, we saw this little uh, zero palette here. Um, so you start to um, rotate the bottles regularly. So you can see this bottle image here, it's put on its side. And right here we have the yeast that are starting to make their way to the top of the bottle so that they're able to freeze it and disgorge the wine. So this takes a little bit of time as well. You have to go, and if you see, you can look up really cool videos online of somebody, it's called Riddling. Um, so uh, if you, there's a new bar in, in New York called The Riddler, and it's a champagne bar. So that's where that comes from. So you can always kind of think of riddling as, as a champagne technique. Um, but you can look up riddling on, on YouTube and you'll see how quickly these people turn, you do a quarter turn every day and they go very quickly because that's, that's how they spend their entire day is just 
every single bottle gets turned. Um, now, of course, there are uh, mechanized machines that, that help you with this, but there is really a, a romanticism that goes into touching every single bottle and making sure that it is being made in, in the exact way that they'd like it to be made. Um, from here, we go into the disgorgement. So I mentioned uh, as soon as the bottle is, is fully upside down, the yeast is compact in the neck, uh, and then you're going to freeze that yeast plug and disgorge it. So usually you'll put it under water, um, open the crown top or the, or the cork that's on the bottle, and the spent yeast will come out in a, in a block that's been frozen. And then very quickly afterward, you can choose to add a little bit more sugar for, for sweetening if you'd like, um, called liquor d'expedition, um, to decide the final level of sweetness, because at this point, the yeast has eaten all of the sugar. Um, and it gets very, very dry. So this is a very necessary part uh, of making champagne. Otherwise, you'll have a very, very acidic wine. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, um, about choosing, to, choosing the level of dosage to, um, to add to the wine at the final moment. And then it gets capped and, uh, and shipped off for us to enjoy. Um, are there any questions about the, the kind of the base idea of how to make sparkling wine at this point? Yeah, I have, I have a question. So at that last part, Olivia, you had mentioned um, the liquor de, uh, de expedition, mm -hmm. which is that sugar mixture added. Yeah. And, um, if you said it's necessary because it gets the wine gets very, very, very dry. Now, do wine bottles need to be labeled differently based on the sugar? Is that is that where residual sugar comes from? Because we can use that term with with wines that aren't sparkling. Well. Yeah, I, absolutely. So, so basically, when you're making still wine, a lot of people will choose to end fermentation because the wine is at the point that they would like it to be at. Um, and at this point, you can change the temperature to kill the yeast and stop fermentation altogether. Mm -hmm. um, for this sparkling uh, style of making wine, the yeast continue to eat the sugar. So um, we're looking at Champagne is a, um, a colder region, right? It's in the northeast part of France. Um, it's continental. It is, um, it's one of the cooler growing regions, which is why it's so good for sparkling wine. Um, the acidity in the grapes is maintained. And, um, and one of the reasons that it's not very good for still wine uh, is because of that really high acidity. So if we're not adding sugar at the end to balance the acidity and make a balanced wine, then you're going to have a very unpleasant, very, very dry wine. Um, some people have, there has been a trend since it started warming up over the past couple of years, um, where some producers are making their wines drier and drier year in and year out and adding less and less sugar and labeling them so. So we'll get into the labeling of those wines shortly, um, but that adding of the sugars is really important. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, so there's a couple other ways to make uh, sparkling wine. So we just went through this whole process. There's eight steps. Um, we talked about how long it takes to release a single vintage or a single bottle of wine. Um, so people are starting to say, how can we make something less expensive, but achieve a similar feeling or idea? Um, and so from here, we get the Charmat or tank method. Um, and really, you're, you're only seeing, you're seeing this in Prosecco. This is the main place that's using this idea. It's actually a... Um, it's basically a bulk way of making, uh, making sparkling wine without the aging. So instead of separating and fermenting each bottle, they, everything happens in a tank with the still wine. So instead of bottling it and then having the, uh, the yeast added back in to create that second fermentation, um, it's staying in the tank. They're adding the yeast to the tank and then they're making that second fermentation there. So the bubbles are all happening in the tank. Um, instead of uh, in individual bottles. Um, we're going to taste uh, side by side um, a Prosecco and something made in the Champagne Method in a moment, um, but you really get a different mouthfeel um, for the bubbles from this method is, is something that really stands out to me um, because they're not taking this time to create an individual bottle um, that is going through this fermentation by itself it's happening in mass and you can tell a difference in the bubbles. Um, the continuous method uh, is 
kind of similar where um, the, the liquor deturage, so that sugar mixture that we're talking about, is being added to the base wine and pumped through a series of pressurized tanks. Um, this is a Russian concept of, of how they should be making um, sparkling wine. So it really only got down to Germany. So Germany is kind of the only place that is using this style of making sparkling wine. And it does have, um, you'll see it, the, the style of wine is called sect, is uh, the German sparkling wine term. And um, typically speaking, it's, it's really only used with sparkling Riesling. Um, so you'll really get these, again, these really small, um, fine bubbles like you see in Prosecco instead of these large bubbles that develop over time in a single bottle. Um, the Petnat method, Petnat is very trendy right now for, uh, for natural wine lovers. Um, it's called the ancestral method. And this is kind of the first way that um, sparkling wine was being made, right? Because it was an, on accident where second fermentation, um, it's, the, the, it's put into the bottle and um, when the first fermentation is complete um, and there's not really a second fermentation in the same sense that you get, you, you still have carbonation because that's a byproduct of making wine. Um, but they basically, there's not a second fermentation. The yeast just continue to eat the sugar that's there instead of start, stopping and then starting again. Um, and they produce the bubbles. And so you will often find a variation in bottles of pet nat where some bottles could be more sparkling than other bottles of wine based on how many active yeasts made it into that bottle. Mm. Um, and then the transfer method. This is very rarely used, um, but it's kind of, it's a combination of the Charmat method and, and the transfer uh, and the traditional method where they're doing the second part, um, the second fermentation in a, in a tank, um, but it, everything begins the same way as, as the regular sparkling wine. This is usually only made for um, large format bottles. Um, so if you're seeing a Giro bomb or, or a very large bottle, this is kind of how they achieve that um, without you know, messing up their, their methodology or how they're, um, how they're making their regular wines. Um, okay, and then lastly is, is pretty much a soda stream. So I didn't put much of a, much of a description on there, but you can, um, I don't recommend it, uh, but you can basically put some wine into a soda stream and insert carbonated bubbles into it, just like you would soda. Um, and that's how we get most of our inexpensive sparklers. So in this, in this sense, there's no real craftsmanship to it. Um, it's really just putting those bubbles in just so that you have bubbles. Um, there's no real winemaking technique in it, if that makes sense. Um, but it does provide a way for, um, for people to be able to purchase bottles of bubbles at, at a lower price point. Olivia, I have two questions. Um, yeah. so based on all of these, these types, and you mentioned where they're most popular and stuff, but I'm curious to know, do all of the areas um, around the world that create sparklers, do you find all of these methods all, all over the place? Or do you, or are, no. are, more, are things more specific to? Things are more specific, and we'll get into that with the next slide when we're talking about Prosecco and Cava. Um, it depends on where you're making wine as to what method you're using. So for example, in, um, in the country of France, uh, you do see pet nat, usually in the Loire Valley. Um, but for the most part, uh, a lot of the prestigious areas will use the term cromant, um, which means that it has to be made in a traditional method, so the champagne method. So based on what the label says on your, uh, on your bottle, um, basically changes how it's probably made. So if it says cava, it has to be made in the traditional method. If it says Prosecco, you can make it in the traditional method, but most people don't because it's not worth the time and, um, and the price tag. Prosecco is meant to be um, something that's made in bulk and, and easily, easily drinkable. Um, you get you can, proseccos that are like done by the carbonation method. No, prosecco is done in the Charmat method. It's it's bulk. So instead of putting it into bottles, this is the one that they're um, making the second fermentation happen in the tank all together at one time. 
is there any way that that people would know when they're buying a sparkler that if they did use like a carbonation method opposed to something that's a little more artistic so, or you know most most bottles of wine that use the carbonation technique will not put a technique on the bottle most people that are making uh either ancestral method or um or traditional method champagne method will include that on the bottle of wine. So it'll either say pet nat, if it's from the United States, it'll say pet nat on it, or it'll say traditional method, or it'll say champagne method, or method champenois. Um, but if they're using those better, um, the, the more time consuming and the, um, the more prestigious styles of making sparkling wine, then typically they're going to advertise that on their bottle of wine. Um, Michael was locked in, brought up the, the point of Frangiacorta from, from Italy. What, what um, does that usually fall into? I, I think that's more the traditional. That's the traditional method. Yeah. So, so we'll get into that on the next, um, next, uh, this slide. So in two slides, we'll talk about that one. But um, right. yeah, there, there are, um, there are definitely multiple styles of wines made in different places, but there are laws that say you can label it this way or you cannot label it this way. Um, so we talked a little bit about adding sugar to the final product to make it not quite as dry. Um, so this is the scale that we see of, um, of dryness. Uh, and most typically nowadays, you'll see brute and under. Extra dry is not in trend and dry is not in trend. Uh, Demi sec you'll occasionally see um, for dessert. Um, and it's very lovely and it's, it's not, it's not usually too sweet. Um, but demi sec, uh, these four brute, uh, brute and shore, extra brute, brute and demi sec are typically the four that you're seeing back in the day, dry and extra dry were a little bit more trendy when, uh, when having a sweeter palate was more, uh, more on, on style. So, um, we'll start with the brute nature or ultra brute. Um, this is the style of wine that you're not really adding sugar to. It's less than three grams. So some people will choose to add zero sugar and then they'll label it um, Brut Nature No Dosage. Um, and that will mean that they have added zero sugar at the end. Keep in mind that when you're adding sugar to a wine, um, typically they're using sugars that are, uh, that are local but not always grape-based. Um, and, and actually usually not great based. So typically speaking, you're adding something along the lines of like a beet sugar. Um, when you move into extra brute, this is kind of the, the style that is very trendy at the moment. Um, it's anything less than, um, than six grams of added sugar. So keep in mind that if you do land on three grams of sugar, you have a choice of labeling it Brut Nature Extra Brut well, you can really, it just has to be less than. So you can even add up to brut. So I can have, you know, six grams of sugar and instead of saying extra brut, because I am nervous about the perception being that it's too dry, or maybe I already make an extra brut that's a little bit drier, I can label it brut. Um, so it's just anything underneath this amount. Uh, and then it gets a little bit more uh, strict about uh, about what you have to have to add in order to call it um, the more sweet styles um, But those are the three that you'll typically see on on bottles when you're when you're purchasing a reading wine list Okay, so um first tasting this evening uh, we have um, Prosecco as well as um, the Reventos uh, Blanc de Blanc, um, which is from uh, Panitas in, in Spain. It is not labeled Cava because they decided to stop labeling it Cava and they created a, a new smaller area within Cava to, to name it, but it is, it is from the Cava region. Um, Cava has to be from Catalonia, Spain. Um, it can be white or rosé, um, but if it is rosé, then it can only be Saunier method, which we'll talk about when we get to the rosé section. Um, and there are a number of grapes that can be used to make cava, but they are all indigenous to, um, to Spain, except for Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. Uh, and since cava was a direct, um, uh, it was made in a direct style as a result of the Reventos family going up to Champagne, learning the style and bringing it back down to Spain. Um, he decided to include those grape varietals um, in, his, in his making of, uh, of cava. 
Um, similar to Champagne, there are aging requirements. Um, they have to be aged in the leaves for at least nine months um, and longer aging for anything labeled Reserva or Ron Reserva. Um, and then for Prosecco, uh, we talked about this style a little bit, um, but we're, we're seeing in Cava traditional method only. Prosecco is going to be the bulk style of making it in tank. Uh, the grapes that are being used are, it's called Galera, um, which is really only grown in Benito. It's kind of this very, um, very like lime curd, uh, citrus, very floral grape varietal. And it's always made in, in the tank method unless it's labeled otherwise. Um, so one style of Prosecco that they make is called Colfondo, and it is Prosecco made from Glera, um, but instead they use the, the traditional method, and then they just leave the leaves in the bottle. Another uh, option from Italy would be the Francia Corsa method, and that is, that is going to be traditional champagne method, but it comes from Lombardy, so a different place in Italy. And then lastly, we have um, Lambrusco, um, which is a frizzante red, so um, made kind of more in that ancestral style, and that's going to be from Emilia Romagna. Um, so if you do have Prosecco and Cava in front of you, um, I think the, the main point of, of tasting these side by side for me is being able to see the difference in, in the structure of bubbles. Um, and the, the different characteristics. So um, in the cava, we're finding that um, it, is, it tastes a little bit more aged. It has more, um, it has more creaminess from being on the leaves um, and also a little more, um, a little more of a style that is like oxidated fruit. So kind of like that apple that's been left out on the counter a little bit longer um, and is starting to brown. Whereas when we're tasting the Prosecco, it's really just fresh, bright, small, small bubbles. And it just tastes very, very fresh. And like a, it, you can tell that there's a difference in, in age in these wines, if that makes sense. Um, Olivia, two questions. Uh, first, is, um, would you say that, um, I, I, I do think that there's a, a general hierarchy to uh, wines and sparklers to um, uh, mainly probably to do with the tradition, the method in which it's made. But generally speaking, would you say that Cava and Prosecco are on the same playing field? Do you think what one's a step above the other? Um, because of aging requirements, I would say Cava is going to be more similar to Champagne than Prosecco. Um, I think Prosecco is really, um, I've had my Prosecco in my glass now for maybe, uh, when did we get started? It's been, so it's been my glass for about 40 minutes and the bubbles have almost completely dissipated. Um, because it's made in this, in this style that is a little less um, handheld um, and attentive to detail, um, it is, in my opinion, a, um, a lesser than wine than cava or champagne, um, just because the winemaking is, is less hands-on. When you get to a bottle of like Francia Corta or Colfondo, those are a little bit different, a little more high end. You'll see that in the price tag, but also in the style that, that you're, that you're tasting. Um, so it, to me, it's sometimes with, um, Prosecco, two things can happen. The bubbles can be so small and tiny that it almost feels like they're kind of like stabbing your tongue um, because they're just so fine. Um, or it can also sometimes be a little too sweet because of um, there's, there's fewer regimen on, on the addition of sugar. In champagne, it's very calculated. Um, and in, in Prosecco, it's like, you know, we're gonna add it because these grapes are really tart and we just need to level it out. So it ends up being a little bit sweeter. So there's, um, there's a little bit less of tradition and less of um, a, an exact kind of science to it, if, it, if that makes sense. Sure, in, in Prosecco you mean rather than? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, the Kava second... is like a, Kava wants to be champagne, so they're, they're constantly doing the best they can to age longer and, and, you know, they learned directly from champagne. So that's what they're striving for. Right. Um, my second question was, uh, 
I noticed that you're drinking out of a wine glass and so am I. I was always taught to taste sparklers in a regular wine glass. Um, can you talk about that at all? I, yeah, I absolutely. I put a slide at the end about that because that's usually a question that I get. Um, I mean, when I was at 11 Madison. Save it to the end. It? Okay, I'm gonna save it. We'll save it. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Okay, um, so now I wanted to do a deeper dive into champagne and why there's so many different styles um, of champagne. So champagne, we're seeing this map I mentioned before. It's in the northeast corner. It's a cooler climate. Um, it is uh, continental. It's north of Burgundy. Um, the grapes that are grown here are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, like I mentioned, but also there is the addition of Meunier which is not grown many other places. You can find a little bit of it in Germany. Um, it was formerly called Pinot Meunier, uh, but it was uh, about two years ago, they dropped the name Pinot and now just refer to it as Meunier. Uh, the smaller grape varietals that you really don't see very often, there are a handful of winemakers that include very small percentages in their blends um, of the rest of the grape varietals, um, are Arban Petit Medlier, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris. So these will get very seldomly blended in um, if they inherit uh, pieces of property that have, have grown those uh, grape varietals in the past, typically speaking. So the style of champagne. So there's a, a number of different styles of champagne that you can get. Um, and when I'm talking about style, um, I'm talking about everything from still wine to sparkling rosé. So anything labeled champagne. Um, so we have the traditional style. Um, traditional is a blend of, the, of three grapes, um, usually sh you know, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. It could be a blend of more, but basically it's a blend of white and red grapes um, to create this very traditional style. Um, some people will label their, um, their bottles of wine saying, you know, um, Cuvée traditional. Uh, is very popular, and that just means this is my very traditional style of champagne um, for my house or for my, uh, you know, the style that I make. Um, the second one would be a Blanc de Blanc. Um, we tasted a Blanc de Blanc um, just now from, from uh, Spain, but they labeled it Blanc de Blanc because it's made from 100% white grape bridles. So the, the um, uh, what is it called? From? Uh, <laughs> the uh, translation, there we go. Translation from of Blanc to Blanc is um, white to white. So they're taking white grapes and they're making white wine. Uh, below that we have Blanc de Noir. So we're making white wine from red grapes. So you can make a champagne that is white wine from all red grape varietals because it's not spending time with the grape skins which we talked about in our red, uh, red programming, where all of the color comes from the skins of the grape. So if you're just pressing the, um, the Pinot Noir and the Meunier, you're gonna get clear juice and then it makes a clear wine. Um, so these styles of doing Blanc de Blanc or Blanc de Noir have become more and more um, trendy among uh, grower champagne. And we'll talk about growers in a moment. Um, we also have Rosé de Saunier, which we mentioned earlier, all cava rosé has to be made in the rosé de saunier method, where they spend time uh, with the skins of the grapes to impart color, or you can blend white and red wine together to get rosé and then do the second fermentation. So you can either get the color from the skins or have red wine and white wine blended together in champagne. Lastly, um, there is uh, Coteau Champenois, which is becoming a little bit trendier, um, but basically is the still wine that's still being made in Champagne. Some of the very high-end houses will release these still wines. Um, for example, Egli Aurier um, makes a very, very good Pinot Noir that is labeled uh, Coteau Champenois. Um, and basically it has to be a still wine that's made in the Champagne region. Within the Champagne region, we have five smaller regions. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of rivers that run through here, right? Um, Montagne de Rims, this is a mountain, and then it goes into a valley. Uh, so we have the Valley de Marne, and then we have one other slope that's called the Cote de Blanc. 
Um, Cote de Cezanne, another slope. This is part of the same kind of uh, slope going down. And then down here we have um, Cote de Bar and the Aube. The Aube has become very, very popular for up and coming young grower champagne makers um, to be able to purchase land and uh, you know, start making their first or second cuvee instead of inheriting a house or becoming a winemaker at one of the large houses. So to characterize these five subregions, each one is better for specific grape varietals. So the Cote de Blanc uh, is a huge chalk covered hill. There's um, mostly Chardonnay grown there. Of course, there are always exceptions, um, but the, the grapes that grow best there are Chardonnay. So you'll find some of the best Blanc de Blanc champagnes in the world being made in the Cote de Blanc. Uh, similarly to Burgundy, they have rated uh, each area or village um, and this came to be when people back in the day were trying to sell their grapes to large houses. They found the best way to um, standardize what price people should be paying for uh, the grapes based on where they're coming from. So people went around and rated each village. Not vineyard, village. So the whole village is getting a single grade and they would get a grade from zero to 100. Anything marked between 90 and 100. Um, so let's say that the 90, you're getting $90 per a ton of grapes at the, at the time. Um, so 90 to 100 was then rated Grand uh, Premier Cru, and then 100% was rated Grand Cru. So, um, so there are only uh, 17 Grand Cru's in all of Champagne, but please keep in mind that when you're seeing Grand Cru, in Champagne, it can be from the whole village. It doesn't have to be from the best sites, it can be from the worst sites, but the whole village gets graded. So um, in the Cote de Blanc, there are six Grand Cru villages. Uh, Montagne de Rim um, is known for the Pinot Noir. All of the best Pinot Noir that goes into Blanc de Noir comes from um, the nine Grand Cru villages in Montagne de Rim. So this is the mountain that's at the very top, the most northern part. Um, similar to, uh, to Burgundy, which we talked about a little bit, Pinot Noir is doing better a little bit farther north where it's even colder, and Chardonnay is doing better in the, the more southern part where it's a little bit warmer. The Val de Marne is um, river banks. There's a little bit more clay there. There's a lot of soil variation. There's only two Grand Cru villages. Um, and until recently, um, there, there was not a lot of talk about how stellar the wines are from this area. Um, mostly because it's it's typically Meunier. A lot of people were not making 100% Meunier uh, champagne. So it was typically seen as a, as a blending grape. And blending grapes are often seen as inferior because you can't make a single wine from it. Um, we actually have one wine today that's 100% Meunier. Um, and so that, that has shifted a lot where now we're seeing these really, really lovely wines that are being made in the Val de Marne from 100% Meunier. Um, the last two regions are really where the young winemakers go. So the Cote de Cézanne is also for Chardonnay, um, and the Aube uh, and the Cote de Bar. Um, there's a lot of Pinot Noir, but you can find all the great varietals there. Olivia, can, do you have time for a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, slide. So, um, and, and also a little bit back to the Cava. So, um, so someone had asked in the, in the chat, can um, a Grand Reserve of Cava have a vintage date? And that led me to also think about the question right now when you're talking about the cruise and the Grand Cruise and how it can come from any location in that village. Um, if it's a crew, does it have a vintage? Can it, should it, or not? Awesome questions. Um, Grand Reserve of Cava's um, always have vintage dates on them. Um, Non-vintage is typically going to be your, your standard cava once you get to the Grand Reserva level. Um, I've, uh, Revintos definitely does that, um, does some, some vintage dates, um, but you can definitely find vintage dated uh, cava for the, for the, um, for the Grand Reserva level. For um, the crews, for Premier Crew and Grand Crew, um, you can have non-vintage, but you can also have vintage. Uh, it's really the discretion of, of the winemaker. So um, for example, um, Pierre Peters, which we're gonna taste shortly, um, this is their Blanc de Blanc. Um, it says Grand Cru 
Brut Grand Cru is what it's labeled, but this is their entry level uh, non-vintage. Um, so they're saying, you know, that this, this is all Grand Cru fruit. Is it all the same village Grand Cru? Well, this one is because it says so on the label. But if it just says Grand Cru and there's no village on it, then you can be blending multiple villages together. But since they're all Grand Cru, you get to label it Grand Cru. Same goes for Premier Cru. Um, does not have to have a vintage date. And, and um, when those grapes are combined from different villages, do you find that it's typically the same grower that owns plots in different areas? Or are these like- I'm Segue. That oh, is such a good segue into this next slide. Okay. All right. Good. Sorry. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. But it, I guess because I'm curious, um, uh, there are so many rules, like, for example, holding back 10% of your of your produce that year, you know, of your wine. The wine. Yeah. And I'm That's curious. Shaded wine. Any laws or guidance? So, so here's what happened in Champagne. Cruise. We, we have these big names, right? Dom Perignon, Veuve Clicquot. Um, you've probably seen when you're walking around like Veuve Clicquot sponsored porches or patios at restaurants. These big names have a lot of money to spend. And it got that way because they were the higher up families back in the day. And so when Champagne came to be and they were, um, most people were houses and they would go around all of Champagne and try to purchase the best, um, the best grapes or wines, either one is fine, uh, from the people that are actually growing the grapes. Does this mean that houses don't have their own vineyards? No, they could probably have their own vineyards as well, but they also get blended with, with grapes that they are purchasing from other people. So the growers, who are the growers of the grapes in, in Champagne if none of them are making wine? Um, a lot of them are just farmers. They don't have the money to go and to purchase a winery or to make their own champagne year after year, sell it, export it, etc. cetera. Um, so here we're seeing two things. Um, farmers are having to sell their grapes because um, they can't afford to, to make champagne, even if they want to. And you're either selling to a house, you're selling your grapes to a house, they're making the wine, it's all theirs, everything has to do with them now, all set. Or you can make the wine if you have the ability to do it, but how are you gonna get a label on it and get it exported? So in this sense, you have a negociant. So a negociant travels around, they buy all the best wines, they slap a label on it, and they say, if, let's say it's me, and I, I go over to my friend's house, and I buy all their wine, and then I have some wine, so I'll, I'll throw my wine in there, and then I go over to my other neighbor, I buy all their wine. Um, well, that would be more of a co-op, because we're all combining our wine together. If I didn't have any wine, and I just bought from my two neighbors, and I put my name on it, then I would be a negociant. I would be, I would be the broker for the wine. Um, so over the past 20, 30 years, there has been a really huge movement in Champagne for the wine, the grape growers to be able to actually work with their grapes and make wine from it. They know the terroir better than anybody. Um, and oftentimes they only have a few parcels. So um, with houses, when they're buying wine or champ, uh, when they're buying grapes or wine from all over, you're getting a blend and then they're creating it in their house style. So like I said before, it's gonna taste the same year in and year out. With grower champagne, you're getting more of an expression of a single place because most of them don't have the money to own, you know, 15 different plots all over champagne. Usually they have four or five, they make their wine and, um, and it's more expressive of the place. Um, the second part of it is there's more vintage variation. So when you hear about vintage champagne, um, the, you're getting a snapshot with grower champagne of a specific place at a specific time. With uh, vintage house champagne, so 2006 Dom Perignon, 2006 was an excellent vintage for Dom Perignon, um, but you're getting a snapshot of all of champagne, not just the Cote de Blanc or, um, or Meunier from, uh, you know, from, from one of the other villages. Um, so for this sense, um, we're, we're going into a movement that's more about making expressive wines based on place 
instead of making wines based on a house style. Uh, I'm not saying one is better than the other by any means. Um, it happens today. I've chosen all grower champagne because I think it's more expressive of a single place. Um, you can certainly buy, um, you can do the same thing with houses and buy, um, you know, buy Krug, Bouffe, Clicquot, and um, Jeeper and put them all next to each other and taste the difference in the house style. And, and that's why Krug, for example, Krug is one of my, is, is my favorite house champagne, um, has gotten such a reputation for, a, for specific styles. So Krug goes for this very rich, very rich style. Um, whereas, uh, you know, some, some of the house styles are a little bit sweeter. Vouv Clicquot tends to have a little more residual sugar. Um, so depending on what you're drinking, um, if it's house or grower, with a house, you're going to get a style. And with a grower, you're going to get a place. So I think that's the big takeaway for, for these. Um, Pierre Peters does happen to be one of the wines that we're tasting today. Um, not the rosé, but the Blanc de Blanc, um, and, and is uh, one of the most prolific um, growers. He um, makes single vineyard wines and some of the most expensive and most sought after wines in the world. Um, but then again, um, houses like Krug also make very expensive and very stellar single vineyards as well. They're just more challenging to get. Um, so the last thing before we do our last tasting, um, so <laughs> Chris had asked about why I'm drinking out of these massive wine glasses that are meant for burgundy when I'm drinking champagne, I'm supposed to be drinking out of a flute, right? Um, I think the, the CEO of Krug said it best. This article came out last year, I believe, uh, when she said, you see, using a flute is like going to a concert with earplugs because it won't let you enjoy what's inside because good champagne before anything else is good wine. And when we're drinking good wine, we wanna be able to take in the aromatics and the characteristics of the wine. Um, and you can't do that out of a flute. Um, flutes are, are very symbolic of, of celebrations and you should certainly uh, continue to use them for, for occasions that warrant a good celebration. But if you're sitting down with a really good bottle of champagne, one, you don't want it to be ice cold because you're not gonna taste anything. And two, you don't want to be drinking it out of a flute because, again, you're not going to get the bouquet, the aromatics that are the whole uh, essence of the wine. So interesting and very well said. I feel bad because we, we talked about the, uh, the or we, uh, you showed me the presentation before and I totally forgot about this <laughs> part. So, uh, but, but you're right. And, and that's uh, so well, well said. Um, you know, and through all of the master classes that you've done for the Harmony Club, it's been a recurring theme that so much of the flavor comes from the aromatics, uh, and that certainly includes champagne and sparklers. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If you're drinking something cheap, throw it in the flute. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> um, okay, so for the last part um, of tasting this evening, I have actually, I've left, uh, I hope this is still cold enough. Um, I've left one cage on so that I can demonstrate how to properly open a bottle of champagne um, because it is, first of all, dangerous. Um, but, uh, but second of all, I think a lot of people struggle with the proper way to open champagne and it can kind of sometimes come off as a, a little nervousness or, or um, something along those lines. So I just wanted to show you uh, how I've been taught through the Quartermaster Sommelier is how to how to open a, a, a bottle of sparkling wine table side and confidently. Um, but we're also going to taste um, a Blanc de Blanc versus a, uh, a Blanc de Noir. Um, so hopefully um, you guys are, are able to, to participate. I have to finish my first two wines. <laughs> and if not, if, if any of the people logged in, if you didn't have a chance to pick up these wines, they're still available on wine.com. Uh, Skernik is also a great distributor, and I'm sure there are other places uh, throughout the metropolitan area or if you're out in the Netherlands or down in Florida that may also have these, uh, these wines as well. So they're worth checking out, I will say. Yeah, I did, I, I did choose three of my all-time favorite champagnes. Um, Similar to, I think we talked about this with Riesling, I think there's a style of Riesling for every occasion. There's dry to sweet, um, there is, you know, 
really light bodied and really rich. Um, so similar to how I say you can put those wines with an entire meal because there's so many different styles. The same thing goes with champagne. I think often people think that a champagne has to be an aperitif. Um, and really when you're, when you're looking at something as rich as Krug or something like a Rosé de Saunier, which has a little bit of structure and a little bit of body to it, um, who says that can't go with, with a steak? If you like bubbles, there is something to go with your entire meal. Um, and I often, if I'm, if I go out for a nice meal, um, I, I will often drink a bottle of champagne throughout, you know, the, at least the first half of my meal and then maybe get a half bottle or something to go with my main course and, and after. Um, but I, I thoroughly enjoy, um, the, the food friendliness of all the different styles of, of champagne. And, and also I might add sparklers can be great to end your meal as well. So not just a pre-meal uh, item, but um, you know, there are some sparklers out there that have a little bit of sautern to them or um, uh, you know, it, are just pair really well with, with maybe chocolates or caramels and, um, and, and things like that. So having ending your meal with, with something sparkling is um, I think just as excellent. Absolutely. Especially, I mean, especially with those richer styles like the rosés, where they yeah. do have a little bit more body. And if you typically like to drink something like Pinot Noir or, you know, like a cab with your chocolates and, and whatever, try some rosé. Right. But sometimes uh, we have wine dinners at the Harmony Club and we'll, we'll pair with maybe a, a vineyard that's known for making Pinot Noir or cabs from Napa, you know, something that's very distinct and very robust. And it's like, well, you know, we can't do... Uh, uh, three courses of Pinot Noir and then have a Pinot Noir with, with dessert as well. Um, but a little more creative also makes um, a, a sparkling rosé from, from Pinot Noir grapes or they make something else. And, and so, um, so we'll sometimes put sparkling with our desserts at our wine dinners, if any of you attend our wine dinners. So. Cool. Um, so, so the last portion, um, comparing uh, Blanc de Blanc versus Blanc de Noir. Um, again, we have Pierre Peters, uh, Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc from, um, from Les Menils sur Auger, which is one of the pristine, if you know, if you know Champagne Salon, um, that is where the same, the same village that that wine comes from. Um, and then also Mousset's uh, Blanc de Noir, they specialize in Meunier. Um, so this is almost 100% um, Pinot Meunier. And um, I would say that the difference between the two styles um, is really in the fruit characteristics. I think with um, Chardonnay, you get more of those kind of apple qualities, more of those, um, since again, it does spend so long on the leaves before it's released, it does have a little bit more of that ox oxidization um, than, you know, than the Prosecco that we tasted. Um, so we get that kind of like oxidized apple note and a real creaminess from the leaves. Um, whereas when I'm tasting something like a, um, like the Mousse Blanc de Noir, I really get more of that cherry, um, strawberry note that you would usually see in a red wine, but, uh, but in the sparkling white wine. Cool. Okay. I'm going to grab the last bottle to do a little opening action for you. So I will be right back. This is a big thing, I, actually, uh, for those of you who are still logged in, uh, teaching staff how to open a uh, champagne table side I can, can be very challenging sometimes. Uh, it's intimidating to some people um, who, who don't uh, frequently drink it. So I'm so happy, Olivia, that you're using this as an opportunity. Um, it's, a, uh, it's very good. <laughs> good, good. Um, so I'm, the first thing you need to know about opening sparkling wine is um, if the temperature is incorrect, that is, um, or you do a quick chill. I had left this on the table in front of me for the past hour, so it's not as cold as I'd like it to be. Um, but if it's not as cold as you want it to be, then there's more often a chance of it fizzing over. Um, so that is the only reason in this case that the wine will be fizzing over. Um, not because I did it incorrectly, but if you do get fizzing over, just keep in mind for next time that you might want to let it sit in the refrigerator a little bit longer or, um, or it's not cold enough. So the first thing that I always do is, um, is obviously take off the foil. Um, most every single bottle of sparkling wine will have a pull tab that makes it super easy to take it off. If I were at 11 Madison Park opening a bottle of champagne, I would actually be using my wine key 
um, and cutting a very straight line around it instead of using the pull tab because the pull tab is sometimes flawed and uh, doesn't always get off um, the entire cap. So sometimes it rips and it creates an ugly seam. Um, so if you're ever, you know, hosting people for dinner and you really want to show off a little bit, then feel free to, um, to grab a wine key and to use the knife on it to um, cut around like you would a regular bottle of wine. Olivia, can you show everyone that wine key? That's called a two-stepper. And I swear by these. Um, it's called a two-stepper because in that bottom portion she was just holding, you'll see that extra screw. There's a hinge. And um, I think this is uh, not only one of the most least expensive, um, but long last best wine openers ever. I have drawers full of them. So if you're ever at the clubhouse and you say, Chris, I remember what you said, give me a wine key. I'd be happy to give you a few. I have so many of them and they are the best. Um, the, the best, definitely. Even, I even have some Skernick branded ones if you... Yes, hey, I, I'll take them. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I think it's funny that you noted that because I'll go back to my parents' house and I'll... You my know, mom never has one and I always forget to bring one with me. So I'll have some expensive bottle of wine and they only have the bunny ears. Yeah. Um, yes. And I, I honestly, I don't know how to use them. <laughs> um, I, I've been a sommelier since I, I was very young and I just... I. I physically do not know how to use them. Um, everybody gets a good laugh out of that. And um, I, I, let me just mention one other thing. I'm so sorry. What you said about cutting around it. Um, I always teach my staff to cut uh, a lot around the lowest lip of the bottle. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Um, I, I so right underneath the cage. Right. right. Yeah. So whatever that lowest lip is, and it prevents the the foil from interacting with the wine, any debris, any anything else, um, and it also kind of helps protect your hand when you're using that two stepper. You can easily run your knife right around that lip, like uh, like you're putting an uh, envelope cutter through an envelope. It's it's very very easy and simple. You have a guide. So, it also sorry. makes a straight line for you to make it prettier. What's that? Straight, straight yeah, line. line. Right, exactly. So I'm sorry, I'll stop interrupting, but, but those are two um, great things to keep so, in mind. So next we have the cage. Um, and every single bottle of champagne uh, is uh, six and a half turns. Um, so it's really interesting because it's, uh, it's just like, you know, every bottle is a, bit, a little bit thicker. This is kind of the, the perfect number of turns to keep this securely on here. Um, so you can count every single time you open a bottle of champagne, five, six, and, um, and then we have it open. Once the cage is open, this is your security, the cages, to keep this um, cork from flying off. I mentioned this bottle is not as cold as I would like it to be. Um, and so it's really important that uh, I'm being as careful as I possibly can um, and making sure that my thumb stays on this cork the entire time. Um, because if I have somebody across from me and I point the cork at them and I lift up my hand, um, you could pop an eye out with that thing. So, um, so it's just, it's just a, you know, make sure that you're being careful where you're pointing your, um, your bottle as well, because they can be pretty dangerous. Um, so after the cage is off, I'm actually not even going to take it off because if I take off the cage, it means my finger's not on the cork and I'm not being safe. So I'm gonna keep my finger um, over the cage the entire time. Um, and I'm actually gonna put my hand on the bottom here. Um, so instead of kind of like going like this, um, I have my hand on the bottom and I have a lot of control. So I can move my hand around with my hand on the cork. Um, it's really easy for me to make this transition and still be very safe. Um, but when I'm ready, my hand goes over the cage and the cork. Um, my hand is, is underneath here. Uh, champagne is one of the only bottles of wine that if your label is not facing the guest the entire time, that's okay because it's more important to be safe than to show them the label. Um, but then I just actually just twist with my bottom hand. And I'm applying pressure on top with my hand. Did you guys hear that? Yes. It was so silent, um, and, and that's the appropriate way to open a bottle of champagne. Well done, very well done. I, I, I frequently try to teach my staff that, uh, and, and silently opening a bottle of champagne. Everybody loves the- The, the party trick. Of a, of a <laughs> pork popping, of course it's a-
the celebratory sound, but um, but the proper way to do it, at least in, in a dining room, is as silent as possible. Yes. As possible. So w- well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, now now um, questions. It's the last last portion. Yeah, so this is our last masterclass. First, let me say thank you so, so much, Olivia. It's such a pleasure to have you uh, and, and to know you and work with you for the Harmony Club's Hawaiian program. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, if any of the members who are still logged in, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or you can press the space bar on your keypad as a push to talk button. Um, uh, but uh, I just want to offer such a big thanks um, to you, Olivia. You've been so knowledgeable. Some of the comments um, that our members have typed in throughout today's program and, and obviously in, in many of the other programs you've done with us, but uh, it was certainly a pleasure, a pleasure to attend. Excellent presentation. Um, uh, one other member said, uh, I could see her in the next, uh, in the very near future to become a master sommelier. She's excellent. Uh, please invite her to the club to uh, host a wine dinner. So we'll have to talk about that. Um, and uh, so, so uh, just know that we're so appreciative. Uh, we enjoy your knowledge and thank you for sharing it with us. You guys have been so much fun. Uh, the questions have been really fantastic. Um, I did get one more question in the comments. Um, about uh, what sparkling wine should you use to make cocktails? Um, there are a ton of super delicious uh, sparkling cocktails. Um, I do not recommend using champagne for any of them because you're not going to get any of the characteristics of your nice champagne. Um, so if you're ever adding anything into sparkling wine, I would recommend using something less expensive like a Prosecco or a Cava. Um, you're still going to have that great structure of the bubbles and a good flavor. Um, but since you're adding more things to it, even if it's just fruit, um, you don't want to have a bottle that, you know, is very intentionally made and, um, and, you know, very, very carefully made, uh, mixed with something else that you can't taste that wine. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, in fact, one of um, our, our two biggest sellers at the club on our cocktail list is our Midtown Sparkler, which uh, we use Prosecco. Uh, we use intense ginger liqueur. It's made here, uh, well, I say here in Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn and I know so do you, uh, but it's made uh, intense ginger liqueur in Brooklyn and then we top it with um, a little crystallized ginger and that's our most popular cocktail at the club. That sounds um, delicious. Yeah, it's, it's really yummy, a little spicy um, and, and good, but uh, that's a great question. A- any other questions? Uh, uh, oh, I'll unmute you, Myra. Uh, I think she has to unmute. Oh uh, yeah, Myra, did you raise your hand? I, uh, can you unmute oh. yourself? It looks like a bottle of boof. Oh, there she yes. is. Perfect. What's the question? Yeah, so that does not have a year, correct? No. Correct. So most, um, most every single house in all of Champagne will make an entry-level wine. Um, the yellow label is Bouffe Clicquot's entry-level wine. Um, the of only course. one that they put, the, it, well, um, not to say that it is an entry-level wine, but it is her entry-level wine. Um, but uh, the, the only the highest levels or the tete de cuvées, the head of the cuvée, um, will get a, a vintage date. So she makes um, La Grande Dame is her top level. And, and that one will have a vintage date on it. Um, but at everyone's entry level, every single wine that we had here today, except for the cava, um, was non-vintage as well, or multi-vintage, so a blend. Um, and again, that's to create the house style of Vouflico. Instead of seeing, like, let's say that 2017 was a bad vintage, um, and she made really tart, really, really un- underripe wine, um, that would mean that her entire year is thrown off because, uh, because the wines aren't going to be as good. Instead, you have this kind of... Um, this backup uh, of reserve wine that you can continue to blend and continue to make your house style um, because you're legally required to hold back 10% of your wine um, for future non-vintages. Um, so it's really kind of a backup plan to make sure that, that, um, that you're able to continue to make wine even in a bad vintage. It's your insurance. Exactly. Um, 
Is that only required? The water bottle, the bottle the Dom Perignon vintage. How do you know which is better? How do you know which uh, vintage of Dom is better? Yeah, I have a lot of bottles. So the one thing that I do really appreciate about Dom Perignon is that they do not release their wine until they feel that it is ready. So in the past couple of years, we've seen the release of 08, 09, and 06. 06 was a really stellar vintage. Um, but they held they held on to it for quite some time because it wasn't ready yet. And um, and I always appreciate when winemakers take their time and say, all right, now this is ready to drink. Here you go. Like 20 years old. You're I have an old, old bottle of, uh, what, uh, what is it again? It's like. 1976. I don't know if it's still good. So the, so I've had many bottles of, of old champagne. My my life changing or like best bottle of wine I've ever had was a, a bottle of um, 1986 champagne from Krug. Um, but it is so temperamental with aging. You really have to make sure it's staying in the best possible conditions, um, or it could go flat or oxidize very easily. Um, so it, what do you do with black champagne? Pardon? What do you do with black champagne? Drink it as wine? Um, you just store it like any other any other red wine. So if you have a cellar or you have a wine fridge, you put it in there and um, you know put it to sleep for a while. Um, and you know you make sure that you're not exposing it to light or um, or vast temperature changes. Um, the term cellar, I think, is, is really the best term for it because if you have a, have a basement or something along those lines, they're usually dark um, and they're, they're not too humid, um, but do have some humidity to keep the cork moist. Um, and those are really the best. Uh, I, I had a basement in Boston that I just, I would just throw my wine in there and I knew that it was fine because it was never going to be over, you know, 70 degrees. And um, and I knew that it was going to be dark all the time. So there wasn't going to be a lot of sunlight to, um, destroy the wine. Um, I think that, that, being said, the, I will say that, that, is will say that the wine is still in excellent condition. I recently so had an old cold cold. for my sister's birthday and it was great. The wine, Go ahead. The wine cellar we made is an old cold, cold room, which is all cement around all wall ceilings and everything. Yeah, um, I think I think with se with the seventies at this point, it's a gamble. It's either, it's going to be fifty fifty. Even if you did the best thing forever, um, there's always a chance. Cellaring wine is always a gamble. There's a chance it's, it's not spoiled. It's just not the way you would have liked it to be. But it's not spoiled. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but I mean, there there is a chance that there might not be bubbles in it anymore. Um, so. It really, I mean, it's it's a hard thing to age. Club soda, hard. club soda in it? No. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. Just put it in the soda stream, and you're all set. <laughs> put it in the soda stream. Why? Such a connoisseur I am. Such a connoisseur. I love it. I love it. Um, but oh, I was gonna say one other thing. Um, about cellaring, and I can't remember what it was. I could do that to you. What would you recommend as a as a average price on vintage champagne? On an average price? Yeah. Uh, retail, I'd say forty to sixty dollars. On a wine list in a restaurant, I would say ninety to one hundred and twenty dollars. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I think that um, that that definitely reflects uh, like standard markups for um, for bottles. Um, certainly, I, I, uh, that's how I would mark things up. Uh, working in standalone restaurants, I can speak to the Harmony Club. Um, we have a, a policy of not marking our um, bottles up as high, uh, and a lot of clubs do that uh, simply so that there is a benefit to membership. So um, the, the numbers that um, Olivia just said make perfect sense to me. Uh, at the club, I'd say um, a, a reasonable bottle, a reasonable price bottle might start a little bit less than that 80 or $90 mark, maybe 70 or $75. Um, uh, occasionally less if I get an amazing deal, if Olivia hooks me up and say, you know, uh, I don't know. 
blowout sale. But um, <laughs> uh, but generally speaking, at the club you can get, and at and at any club that you may be members of, the other clubs probably operate the same way. Um, I work clubs and all three of them operated the same way in that our standard markup formula is less than a regular standalone restaurant. So, uh, which is that's, nice. That's something to take advantage of. Yeah. yeah. As, as somebody that often spends too much money on, on champagne when I'm dining out. <laughs> when uh, my apartment is small. <laughs> well, we're just coming up on 90 minutes, so I want to, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to end it here unless there's any urgent questions. Um, uh, but again, Olivia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. For your expertise. Thank you guys so much for coming. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Well, we'll certainly invite you uh, to the clubhouse um, uh, as uh, guidelines permit us to when we start our phased reopening in September. Uh, for the members that are still logged in, please continue to check out our calendar online. Our next upcoming event is Trivia Tuesdays starting on July 7th. Uh, feel free to make a team with other members and sign up with a team name or you can be your own team. This recording, as well as all of the recordings from our other Wine Master classes, are available under the Virtual Clubhouse section on our mobile app, uh, on our website, and uh, on our YouTube page. Uh, Olivia, thanks again. You thanks, are guys. Good to see you. Thank you.